to the Northern Cape now as we reflect on the provincial government's tenure which is coming to an end next year and uh, when he took office Premier Zamani Sol set out to, to plans in fact to tackle some of the province's service delivery challenges a lion's share of the budget goes towards education and health which are some of the key priorities there are also of course the issues around youth unemployment as well as service delivery in some of the areas and our Northern Cape Premier Dr Zamani Sol joins us now to discuss the successes as well as challenges that are affecting the province. Thank you so much, Premier, for your time this afternoon. Let's start with reflecting on your tenure, of course, as Premier. For you, what would you count as successes? No, thank you very much, uh, Bongiwa, and uh, good evening to, to your viewers. And I must mention that it has been a very difficult tenure, and as you know, that half of this five-year term was a time where we, all of us had to focus on fighting COVID. And that fighting of COVID actually necessitated redirection of funds into strengthening our healthcare services in order to protect the lives of South Africans and also to mitigate the impact of COVID. The second thing, which was also some kind of a tragic setback, is the sporadic load shedding, which has got a direct impact on the economy, and particularly here in the province, as we are a commodity-based economy. But with all of those, we've managed to make some major strides on some few areas. Over the past three years, we managed to keep a consistent increase in our percentage for grade 12. So when we started in 2019, we were standing at 66%. And now, just last year, we're standing at 74%, which is a reflection of the kind of investment that we've been doing and particularly directing some of our resources at improving the quality of public education. But also we managed to make major strides in one of the areas that you've mentioned, which is unemployment. Uh, when we started in 2017, there were about 264,000 people that were in gainful employment in the Northern Cape. I'm sure if you look at the latest uh, report by States SA, we are standing at 321,000 people that are employed in the province, which is about 50,000, more than 50,000 increase in the number of people that are employed. With quarter four of 2022, we recorded the lowest unemployment in the country and the lowest unemployment amongst the young people, which was standing at 30%, mm. far below the national average and far below the second performing province. So it's mixed results, two setbacks, but with all of that, we really managed to push as hard as we can. And talking about, you know, some of uh, these setbacks, we're looking at uh, some municipalities that all ask them over three billion rand. How do you begin then to deal with this as a province? Yeah, that's quite a depressing situation. And I hope one day one will have an opportunity to put this matter into proper context. Uh, the population of the Northern Cape is about 1.3 million. Out of the 1.3 million, you've got more than 600,000 of them who are social grant beneficiaries. What that means is that the majority of households in the Northern Cape, the primary income is social grants. So it's very difficult sometimes for social grant beneficiaries who are heading these households to pay for their services at municipalities. And because we are such a vast province with very low population, uh, our towns are very small, sparsely populated, and with almost no source of revenue. So those are some of the challenges that we are sitting with. Uh, the state of municipalities in the Northern Cape is depressing, mm. and that is the reason why, as the provincial government, we managed to put up a team that, will, that is working very closely with municipalities to capacitate them on different areas, which is revenue generation, 
and also to ensure that we improve their audit outcomes. And talking about revenue generation and that last point that you mentioned, the audit outcomes, what would be the point of trying to capacitate them if the AG is saying that they cannot manage their finances and the, there's a culture of unauthorized, wasteful and fruitless expenditure? So it means you've got a bigger problem than just generating revenue. There might be wrong people in the wrong positions. We, we, we are sitting with a major problem of, of, uh, of, of recruiting and being attractive to rare skills in the province. It's not only a problem of municipalities, it's also a problem for the provincial government. It's very difficult in the province to get a CFO, chartered accountant, properly qualified, to go to a small municipality and be employed there. Those who come, they just stay there for a year or two years and then they leave. So that's one of the challenges that we are sitting with because we're a small province competing mm. with much bigger provinces like Houte and KwaZulu Natal in the Western Cape and even Free State. So we find it very difficult to retain skills. And how the legislation is now, the Systems Act, it does not give us any space in which we can create some kind of incentives in order to ensure that uh, people who come to the province with the rare skills, we give them incentives that will make them to stay. So what normally happens is you get people coming in, as soon as they are in for a year or two, they leave the province for greener pastures in much bigger provinces where there is much better amenities of life. Mm. So this is one of the issues that we need to attend to. Hence, we tried to strengthen the Premier's Basari Fund to produce our own accountants in the province, to produce our own engineers. And I can report now that just this year alone, we've got more than 200 young people from the Northern Cape. We sent to different institutions in the country to get training on these critical areas of skills. And talking about uh, young people, the Premier, there's a very disturbing story, and it's not only unique to, to the Northern Cape. We also saw it um, in Gauteng as well as Guazul Natal as well. The number of young people, children, in fact, if I can even put it that way, falling pregnant. And surely this, this mm. is a serious area of concern. And it, it doesn't look like we are seeing those behind these horrific acts being put behind bars. It's, it's an indictment for us as government. Uh, when we closed for COVID in 2021, uh, we had about 5,100 teenagers that felt pregnant in the Northern Cape. And uh, last year, the figure reduced to 3,900. But with the reduced figure, which is 3,900, we are actually still the capital of the world if you look at teenage pregnancy per capita. For our population, it's quite a high number of teenagers who are falling pregnant. Hence, we've established uh, an interdepartmental task team that is working on the matter. And uh, in the next Executive Council meeting, we are going to get an integrated response on how best to address the matter. It's a very mm -hmm. sad thing, mm -hmm. which all of us must take seriously. We also invite communities to take uh, responsibility for this. But what we need to also mention is that if there's a child who is le less than 16 years old and falls pregnant, that's a case of statutory rape. And police must take up this matter without flinching and ensure that those perpetrators are brought to book. Let's talk about, you know, something else. There's a story we've been following quite closely here at, uh, you know, SABC. On the 6th of June, the Maharing mayor promised residents as well as parliamentarians that had visited that particular area that in just a few days, water will be restored. The issues of water will be resolved. A few weeks later, we went back. It was still the same with uh, some explanations, but not even as much as trying to understand what exactly is going on there. Now, if residents are listening and watching such 
um, you know, happen where a mayor promises that in a few days this issue will be resolved, then these are residents that are, are relying on water tankers in order to be able to access water. Surely this is not going to bode well for them. And I wonder what action is then taken in that regard against, you know, such behavior. We, we had engagements with the mayor and we also agreed that we need to strengthen our capacity, get more trucks and also ensure that we get more Jojo tanks to ensure that at any given time community does have access to, to water. But there's an infrastructure project that is running there mm. and towards the end and the completion of that infrastructure project, which was going to ensure that there is seamless uh, running of water in Mahareng. Sluice gates were opened and the project where it was taken place was over flooding. And that over flooding just took place about two weeks back. So that took the project completely back. That is the reason why the project could not be commissioned uh, and now they are still using uh, Jojo tanks and also water trucks. But so, so for someone who's watching together tonight... Together with the Department of Public Works, we actually commissioned... Mm. Yes. For someone who's watching tonight, pardon me for Department coming in there. Public Works what do we say to them? What, yes. do, what do we say to yes. someone who's watching tonight in that area? What timelines are we giving them, Mr. Premier? Yes. No, one can actually say within the next uh, two months or within the next uh, month and a half, we would have been able to finish that because I know that the Department of Public Works, together with the municipality, they are working flat out mm. to ensure that the issue gets addressed. But it's just some kind of a disaster that happened there. Uh, the sluice gates were opened and that over flooded the project which was being implemented and almost completed. So they are working on it to fix the problem and very soon the community will be having running water. Can the same but be said for the, the bucket in the toilet inter system? Intermediate, the, we've increased, we've, in, we've increased, yes, yes, that's what we are also working on together with the Department of Water and Sanitation, the eradication of buckets in the province. Also I'm mentioning the issue of buckets, I think it's also important to mention that 91% of households in the Northern Cape have got adequate sanitation. Mm -hmm. There are instances uh, where there are still buckets and we are seriously working at trying to address the matter. Now, when we then look at, of course, the issues around, you know, service delivery and especially when it comes to, to youth unemployment, we touched on this a little earlier on in our conversation. Of course, even one person, one young person being unemployed yeah. is a huge issue. What are some of the plans that you would say as a province you're putting in place yeah. in order to make sure that the numbers continue to, to you know, to, to decline of those who are unemployed as we've seen in, you know, as a trend, particularly where your province is concerned? Yes, the Northern Cape is the only province now in the country that has got a ministry for young people. And the first responsibility of that ministry for young people is to coordinate initiatives by both the private and the public sector on creating opportunities for young people. What the provincial government did already is to ensure that there's about 330 million rand available to that ministry for training of young people and funding of ideas of young people. 210 million rand thereof is coming from Mercita, we are working with Mercita, and 110 million rand is coming from the provincial government. So there's 330 million rand at the disposal of this department, this ministry responsible for young people, for training of young people, because one of the major problems in the Northern Cape it's a low-skill-based uh, province. There are job opportunities that have been created in the mining sector and as well as in the renewable energy sector. But the young people in the province don't possess the necessary skills in order for them to get those job opportunities. Hence, our primary focus is to look at the available job opportunities and look at what would be the matching skills in order to ensure that we train young people to get those matching skills with the job opportunity. This misalignment between our skills base and the 
opportunities which are available. It's something that we need to first and foremost address in order to ensure that young people get absorbed in the economic mainstream of the province. And that's very critical. You know, we just had a conversation about that on the show, looking at the skills gap and how some of the young people are mismatched. And that also makes things a little difficult for them. Premier, if I may, um, if you may please allow me to, to take you down this road, if you can wear a different hat now and be an ANC chairperson yeah. in the Northern Cape. Let's talk about your, um, you know, your views, your thoughts as as an ANC member when it comes to the expulsion of former Secretary General Ace Mahashule? Uh, I think that is, uh, that's a setback, it's sad. And I don't think uh, any self-respecting member of the ANC can basically celebrate that decision which was taken by the disciplinary committee. But with all of that, uh, if there is no discipline, there is no organization. In order for us to ensure that we continue to have an organization uh, where there is a discipline, we, we need to allow the properly constituted and elected structures to do that. But I firmly believe there's still an opportunity for Comrade Ace. He can appeal to the National Executive Committee. And in the past, National Executive Committee would look into decisions taken by its disciplinary structures and if there is a need reverse those decisions for a much linear sentence. So I don't know what would happen but there is a door open for him uh, to actually appeal to the National Executive Committee of the ANC. But it's, it's very sad. Uh, he's been in the ANC for all his life and leader of Free State for many, many years became the Secretary General of the ANC. In actual fact, if you look back into the history of the ANC, is the first sitting official like the Secretary General who gets expelled whilst in office and uh, who got suspended and later expelled. And I, I think it's very sad happening and something which mm -hmm. I firmly believe if it can go to the NEC, the NEC might look into it differently depending on the facts and the merits of the case. And another issue, of course, is the inquest docket that has been opened around the passing of someone you spoke very fondly of, uh, the late Tina Jamad Peterson. Uh, what do those developments you know, mean for you, particularly yeah. um, when it comes to her passing? Because we know just how much of a blow this was to the ANC. Yeah. We, we are anciently, anxiously waiting as the province to know what actually happened. Uh, because uh, up to so far, we don't really know what's the cause of death and we would, we would love to know. And uh, what makes it more sad is that uh, there is so much negative rumors around uh, Combretina and what could have happened. Uh, she does not have an opportunity to respond for herself. That is very sad. The Tina we know is not the Tina that is being projected in the media. Is not a corrupt Tina that is being actually blended around. That's not the Tina that we know. We know a Tina Jumat who sacrificed a youthful stage, who sacrificed everything, including her family, to work very hard for the African National Congress. We know a Tina when she was the provincial treasurer of the ANC here in the Northern Cape, that was an epoch of self-sufficiency of the African National Congress. And she would even go to an extent of using her money to fund organizational programs. So the one that's been projected in the media based on some allegations that are made by the husband of Mkwebana, we don't know about that Tina. What we fondly remember is the Tina that we've worked with in the African National Congress in the province. Mr. Premier, thank you so much for your time and those reflections. Uh, we do appreciate you taking us uh, down your tenure as a Premier. And what are some of the wins and the successes and, of course, some of the priority areas, as you say, right now when it comes to some of the issues around youth unemployment, around, you know, service delivery. Thank you so much. Do appreciate your time. That was Northern Cape Premier Dr. Zamani Saw.